or can we proceed with the serological test? Yeah. Uh, and please raise your hand. How many of you are interested or are already working on serological tests like ELISA, Western blots? One, two, three. Okay, that that that's good. So I think I am not going to again teach you the serological, but we can just discuss some ideas and uh, expertise exchange. So I will also learn a lot of things from you. Okay. Uh, so as the topic says, we have uh, we have. We have focused on antigen as antigen and assay specificity, bacterial, viral, parasite, fungal, uh, etc. How to make the lysates? sets? Uh, then some recombinant proteins, right? So I will also explain you how recombinant proteins can be performed and why they are have upper hand or advantage over the antigens in serological test. Then we will see some epitopes and mimotopes or mimotope, we say. So they are all antigens what we use in the serological test. Okay. So on the board, I will draw in brief uh, different um, antigens and, and some definitions. Hello. Yes. So in any serological test, uh, what we are currently doing, what we need is uh, antigen, right? And then second one is what we need is antibody or antibody. Antibody either comes from the sample, uh, serum sample, or antibody can be a recombinant antibody or a monoclonal antibody, depending on the assay, that is what you are uh, using, direct assay, indirect assay, or sandwich assay and so on. So the position of antibody or antigen differs from assay to assay. So in this session, what we are going to speak about is antigen and how different antigens we could use to increase the sensitivity or on the other hand, increase the specificity. And sensi sensitivity and specificity is like a balance so taraju so if you if the sensitivity is higher the specificity can be lower and if the uh, specificity is uh, higher then sensitivity can be lower but can be could be uh, but you should have some balance uh, between the sensitivity and specificity and there are hundreds of ways how to balance that Okay, right from, and it begins from uh, the biology. That means whether the uh, virus is so generous to its antigen. For example, uh, again, flaviviruses. So uh, there are some cross reactivity uh, of the anti anti antibody to different antigens from the uh, viruses in general. Sorry. Uh, I think I need to open my right. Yeah. Okay. 
So uh, the antigen preparation is extremely important. As yeah, please. Do. So antigen preparation is extremely important to avoid all other garbages that is coming from the along with the sample or some carbohydrates, glycans, uh, fat and everything that you need to remove, right? And you should have a specific protein as and substance that is your antigen. So we have three or four different terms. What? Okay. Oh, can you please ask online whether they see? Okay. So first what you have is antigen. And then we have epitopes. And then we have mimotopes. So what is a difference behind that? But if we start whole cell, a whole cell lysate antigen. Okay. So we have three categories of the antigens. First one is whole cell antigen or classical cell antigen or classical cell lysate. Then we have epitope. Do you know what is a paratope and epitope? Some basic questions, but I would like to make these things very clear. So what is a paratope? Anybody? Sorry? Antibody, exactly, the paratope. And the uh, epitope is the a binding site for that anti antibody. So antibody binds to the antigen. And then what is mimotope? No. So usually what you see, good morning. So usually what you see that all the uh, ELISAs are based on antigen, okay? For that you need that particular bacteria or virus or antigen. But, but you, if you don't have bacteria or virus, for example, you are working on some uh, uh, extremely BSL-4 viruses, you want to screen something. For example, uh, there was an outbreak of um, Ebola and you want to screen. Either you have two options, you have to have uh, Ebola antigen procured or you should have something that mimic, okay? And that mimic antigen is mimotope, okay? So mimotope is usually a small peptide, usually uh, seven to uh, 19 or 18, let's say 19 amino acids, not uh, the DNA, but amino acids. And that resembles, uh, or the structure of this mimotope is resembled to, to ah. so the structure resembles the structure resembles to the epitope, but the structure it has nothing to do with that apparent uh, antigen parent. Um, uh, bacteria or virus, but its structure resembles. As the structure resembles, we can use this structure as an antigen. Okay, and this structure comes usually from phase display or different uh, molecular techniques or a peptide library. Now, let's see in short what is a peptide library and what is a uh, phase display. Okay, so those who have a lot of money, like uh, Dr. Jende, they can they, they they can afford the peptide library. So peptide library is a tool. Uh, you you uh, order the peptide library and and you order the diversity of the peptide. I'm going a little bit this part more deep, and then we will come back to the normal part. Okay, so the. So the peptide library, library, just imagine you have 10 rest to 7 up to 10 rest to 13 
different sequences in one tube okay so it will come with methionine arginine glycine and so on so it will be scrambled and that scrambling uh, the diversity goes up to 10 raised to 13 and each peptide each peptide will be will be tagged either n terminus tag or c terminus tag with biotin okay now what you do is uh, in a basic laboratories what you do is for example i have the specific antibodies against ebola okay that i can purchase but i don't i cannot purchase the ebola you cannot but you can purchase antibodies against ebola and that antibodies you conjugate to you incubate what is going on to so you incubate with the peptide library okay and antibodies will catch the peptide if the antigen or mimotope is specific okay you got the point and then what you have to do is you have to with the biotin with the biotin you have to capture whatever it was remaining on that antibody and with lcms for example on up there you have tandem mass spectrometry with that you identify the sequence of the peptide okay so it is called as n-terminal sequencing or you can also insert decay sequencing and so on so all identification of sequences could be done on the body and once you get the sequence that is the antigen for all assays now the plus and minus point first one is the basic um, the fundamental research or basic research is a little bit difficult huh? that is Huh? Yeah. So the basic research is lengthy. It, it will take two to three months just to find a particular mimotope or a particular uh, peptide. But then you can purchase this antigen for 200 euro or 200 dollar in milligram. It, it is quite cheaper than what you use your virus or produce your bacteria or, for example, coxiella somebody's working is very difficult to produce right or cultivate so and then purify so from company you get purified peptide and so we will now discuss the sensitivity and specificity. if you have one antigen the specificity will be extreme right one antigen in your assay the specificity will be very good because you don't have other non-specific targets or how about sensitivity to increase the sensitivity you can increase the concentration of antigen one one way of increasing sensitivity okay to increase the concentration of and from viruses or some coxia light is very hard from here it is very easy so you go get the difference between antigen epitope and mimosa. Okay. Uh, I request all online participants, please uh, mute your mic. Okay, so what we saw here is a peptide library that comes uh, around three thousand to four thousand U dollars uh, one library. But once you have this library, you can use it for whatever you want, actually. The sky is limit in this case. You can use this library for the uh, identification of marker against uh, in a cancer or infectious diseases or whatever is universal library. Now, epitopes. If I have, if I have uh, an, if I have an antigen over here, okay, and this antigen will have some pockets, some binding pockets. So those binding pockets are two different types of binding pockets, okay. 
first one is antibody binding pocket and the receptor binding pocket okay for example this antigen if it interacts with a cell this is cell wall okay so this pocket of the antigen is called as receptor binding site the term is extremely familiar to you the rbs receptor binding site in covid we saw that there is receptor binding domain rbd right so all of these antibodies were against rbd so this is same rbs or rbd rbd so this receptor binding <coughs> site or domain must not be your antigen okay it the antigen could be over here antigen could be over here or antigen could be over here okay so <clears throat> the epitope could be of two types first one is linear epitope and the uh, second one is a structurally or uh, conformational uh, epitope so the linear epitope is either a pe peptide a linear epitope could be from here to here okay so this sequence could be uh, an, an epitope or it could be the protein is folding like this okay protein is folding like this and this part come nearer to this part and it forms some pocket cup like structure or pocket and that is called as a conformational epitope okay and if you take half of that part then the epitope is vanished okay so this is a, a, a conformational epitope which epitope we should use for uh, development of ELISA or development of recombinant uh, proteins or development of this uh, immuno acid linear linear will be much easier okay because it is easier to make linear peptide or linear protein rather than conformational because uh, to make the protein recombinantly and uh, to fold it it's quite difficult okay so it is better to choose some linear now okay so so as as i sh uh, sh show you here we could have a linear or a conformational and one antigen for example omph or outer membrane protein h or, or outer surface protein a b c from different um, uh, bacteria they could have six to seven epitopes different six to seven six to seven not more than that okay otherwise what will happen is this bacteria or this antigen will produce a lot of antibodies against against the bacteria and it is not good for bacteria okay so bacteria tries to keep the antigen or epitopes as minimum as possible or sometimes bacteria tries to hide the antigen that is quite different story so sometimes you need to produce two different types of antibodies against two different epitopes and where you will need that in elisa assay or in lateral flow assay okay or in competitive elisa right so to develop elisa or the, the serological assays sometime you need one or sometime you need two different uh, antibodies against same antigen okay and now the third one is <clears throat> whole cell lysate that is you just take uh, purified coxella i don't know if you, if you can purify coxella with ultra centrifugation yes no yes so in that case you have a mess of uh, culture medium or cells as well as coxella 
but in some cases you can also purify very well your bacteria so there are different ways to purify okay so let's go one by one but up till now do, do you understand what is antigen epitope and mimotope i tried to cover that as simple as possible <clears throat> let's start with wholesale antigen because i think most of you will start with wholesale lysate rather than going for epitope or mimotope but why i showed you here because our expertise is in mimotope my PhD students they have developed a mimoto for against Lyme disease or against adrenaline as well, uh, biosafety level 3 viruses. And regarding the epitope, we map epitope. Okay, so for example, not all epitopes are known, but we map the epitope. Uh, and mapping of epitope is quite easy, it is not something rocket science. But once you have the LMS, what you have here with LCMS, you can map the epitope. Once you map epitope, you can develop your own anti own assay. So uh, one student is working on uh, epitope determination. One student is working on the determination of um, receptor binding site. And during my PhD, I was working this. Uh, wholesale lysate because uh, the science was not that advanced uh, in my laboratory actually. Okay. okay, so let's go to wholesale lysate. Can you please tell me what are the methods you are using to make the antigen or you have used the, some method? How you make the antigen? Formalized, formalin treated, formalin is virus or uh, bacteria, formalin treated. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and any other? Okay. Yeah, but which, uh, what method you use? Okay, so actually there are hundreds of different methods what you can use. And I can take, uh, say that not a single method is bad or not a single method is ideal. Okay, each method has its pro and con. So uh, the best method is proven method. <laughs> okay, for you and for other people. So I will try to now go to Okay, so uh, this is a protein purification or how to make the lysate. Okay. So usually we use, uh, first we try to purify our pathogen. I hope that you all are working with some pathogen because I have list and most of you are working with pathogen and not with uh, eukaryotic cells like uh, cancer or oncocells, no. So let's stick to the pathogen. Now, either you have intracellular pathogen or extracellular pathogen. Uh, either it is growing in the, in the medium or it needs some cell like coxial, like need cell, cell line or something. So there are different, different kind of um, pathogen cultivation. So for the bacteria, those who are working or growing on the media, it's quite easy. You just scrap and uh, you, start with the protein purification. But for the bacteria, it is extremely important to get rid whatever material coming from the scrapping, you get rid and you need to wash it with phosphate buffer saline or trace buffer saline or whatever, TBS or PBS. For the cell, there are two types. First one, 
is the capture and concentrate or get or just forget capture and concentrate and do with the whole cell lysate okay so the capture and con concentrate concept is if you have some antibody a specific antibody this antibody can be captured on the uh, magnetic beads okay and with magnetic beads you concentrate the specific pathogen so once you have a concentrated pathogen or wash pathogen we use a different methods first one is a spreading with sand that is just grinding with sand uh baltoni balls are the same like sand or the beads then potter homo homogenizer osmotic lysis weiss meal uh, you have ultrasonic homo homo uh, homogenization and french press so among those how many of you have used french press no so french press is like the same device like we do a french press coffee okay so what you do is there is small chamber and you just put your sample and press it because of the very intense and high uh, high pressure the cell will break so this is called as french press uh, machine is not expensive but is not common ultrasonic homogenization how many of you have used ultrasonic one you have this uh, rod at sonicator sonicator so this is one of the best one of the best A french press is good this is taken ultrasonic homogenization but in that case you will have increase in temperature weiss meal some a uh, meal so the principle of spreading baltoni homogenizer oh, sorry uh, and weiss meal is the same just milling and then you have osmotic lysis osmotic lysis is the best method if you want to keep the integrity and structure of the antigen intact sometime with uh, ultras ultrasonic and french you may have some deformity in the antigen here osmotic lysis everything will be perfect everything will be at its native stage okay so how to do that osmotic any clue osmotic lysis any clue it's very simple actually you just add more glucose okay so just put glucose 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 and you will have osmotic lysis okay so in buffer you just put glucose uh, there are several reagents see what you can use but glucose is the best because it's cheap and uh, it's very easy to remove with the dialysis yeah because the molecular weight uh, yesterday or on thursday i showed you through the blood brain barrier the water and glucose goes right why glucose goes is very small and whatever is small is the best for the sample preparation okay so that we are going to see a sample preparation techniques or antigen techniques and there you will see whatever is small is is the best for the sample preparation okay grinding bowl we know all this right so you just put your and this is the best for yeast this is the best for fungus uh plant yeah and and some parasites yeah the best but uh, one trick is behind uh, if you just put your sample just like that and you just start to triturate you will lose a lot of time but if you put in liquid nitrogen what will happen it, it is fast it is in one minute you will have very nice powder so it's potter homogenizer is the same same principle so you put a sample here and it will start a bidding and this is a uh, tissue homogenizer or the same what we were, we were having stomacher in fhph department still it is there 
Yes, still it is here. So it's the same principle to match our homogenizer. Homogenizer can have multiple blades. It will homogenize like a mixer, uh, and then you can make the sample. Okay, so this mixer is for the animal tissues as well, but the negative point over here is you cannot use for bacteria and viruses this kind. This, this is just crude uh, breakage of your tissue sample. That's it. But later you need to purify somehow. And then once you have the purified lysate or pu sorry, purified uh, things from the tissue, then you go for tonication. Okay, so we will see some example. For example, you have, um, for example, you have tissue. I, I would put in liquid nitrogen, and I would use first either grinding bowl or this or uh, the homogenizer to disintegrate the tissues. Then whatever is coming out, I suppose that there is my pathogen or there are my parasites. If they are highly embedded in the tissues, then I need to disintegrate those tissues, either with protein SK or some other enzymes. And then whatever is coming out, I will go with the, with the, uh, with the sonicator, okay? So step by step, from the big tissue, you extract the pathogen, from pathogen, you extract the protein. Now, uh, I, have the, I have enlisted some buffers, which are the best buffers. Of course, you can use different buffers. Uh, these are the buffers I use usually for the sonication or also extraction of the uh, antigen, phosphate buffer solution for, or phosphate buffer saline, TRIS HCL solution, saturate buffer or HEPAS buffer. Apart from that, you can use, so all these are a native buffer. So again, buffers are divided into two categories or three categories. I would say three. So those who are good in LCMS, they can, they can know or they know the volatile buffer. So let's see the uh, buffers, their advantages and disadvantages, okay? So, I think this is very important. Uh, you might have used PBS, right? Phosphate buffer all. But PBS is universal, but not always good. Not always good. Okay, let's see. So PBS, advantage. Uh, it will keep the antigen in native state. It will not de denaturate, okay? But the PBS can give you a background in ELISA, okay? And I, I heard that alkaline phosphodase, you cannot use PBS, right? Have you, anybody is using conjugate of alkaline phosphodase or only HRP? Okay, so if you are using HRP, this is fine. If you are using alkaline phosphodase, this is not good. Tris SCL buffer, so Tris SCL buffer, is the second option to the phosphate and it contains uh, amines, primary amine. So the system where you are using a different, uh, a different uh, secondary, uh, not antibodies, but um, the chromosome system that will interfere with primary amines, you cannot use this buffer. The saturate buffer solution, again, this is extremely rare because what you see there, 4.2 to 6.8, so PK is between five. Now, you may say, why I should use that acidic buffer? Yes, but sometimes the protein is not stable at seven or at eight, eight okay, or neutral or at um basic so that's why some proteins are comfortable at an acidic ph so for that you need citrus buffer and the hepes buffer hepes buffer is used 
commonly in case of cell culture. So, HEPA buffer is recommended for, for example, Coxiella mainly. Those antigens are coming from the cells, from the cell culture. You should use HEPA buffer because <laughs> you are using HEPA in the cell culture, right? So, why you need Delta. to change the buffer? Delta. You should not change. So, online participants, please mute your mic. Okay, so let's stick to buffer first. So, these are the examples of uh, native buffer. Let's talk to denaturating buffer. Okay. So, denaturating buffer, any example can you tell me? Denaturating buffer. RIPA, R I P A. RIPA buffer, R I R R I P A. RIPA buffer. So, if you want to extract your protein 100%, you use RIPA buffer. Okay, that is one of the best um, denaturating buffer. Then, and now you play with different uh, substances, for example, urea, guanidine hydrochloride, so urea, GUHCl, guanidine hydrochloride, SDS, and DTT or beta mercaptoethanol. So, I repeat. Ripa buffer. Uh, then there are two denaturating agents, urea, guanidine hydrochloride, and uh, SDS. Right? Uh, urea is available. No problem. Uh, now, uh, those who are interested in this denaturating stuff, uh, believe me that it works really good for all the proteins. So, I usually recommend uh, or use denaturating buffers that contains urea, okay, and that, con that contains, for example, uh, one of these sorbitol or PMSS, but I will come back to this. So, first one is urea. So, my ingredient of choice is uh, phosphate buffer saline. Okay. I have not added here because phosphate buffer saline plus 8 molar urea. So, uh, I think I need to tell you how to make that. It is extremely important. So, I think molecular weight of urea is 60. 60, right? 60. So, 8 molar means 480 gram in 1 liter, almost half kilo in 1 liter. So, first you have to put, take that half kilo and dissolve up to 1 liter. Okay. So, that is extremely tricky and then it takes long time to dissolve. Okay. So, that is 8 molar urea in PBS. Uh, the second part is that or second component is guanidine hydrochloride that is 6 molar okay not 8 6 molar but guanidine hydrochloride is not good for SDS page so forget it <laughs> it was just theory but in practice you use urea and then third buffer is we saw first we saw the native then we went to denaturating so denaturating just you add denaturating agent in native okay for example then uh, also you can add sds 0 0.1 to 1 percent sds is feasible and then volatile buffers so volatile buffers are really good 
alternative for almost everything. Because uh, when you prepare your sample, very often you need to concentrate that, right? And that concentration also concentrates the salt. So for example, if your phosphate buffer saline has 1.2 molar of the salt or 1.5 molar salt, if you concentrate, the salt concentration will go up, right? And it's very difficult to make ELISA with very high salt concentration. You, uh, then antigen will feel that they are sitting in tar um, solvent. So it is not feasible. So you need something that will just evaporate. So for example, best what I use is ammonium bicarbonate. So that is called as ammonium bicarbonate buffer. It's just one example. There are 15 or 16 different buffers. I can send you uh, by email or uh, through WhatsApp. So there are 15 or 16 buffers, uh, volatile buffers that could be used for uh, sample preparation. The good point is that you just keep your sample at room temperature or at elevated temperature a little bit at 40 degree and it will evaporate. Once it evaporates, your antigen get concentrated, right? Very simple. Okay, now these players, You can add in your buffer sucrose, sorbitol, PMSF. PMSF, you know what is that? Uh, and then uh, benzoid. So whenever you you are breaking the cell, okay, what will happen? Two things. First, the whole the machinery that keeps all the protein intact will disintegrate and the proteases will come out. And the proteases is a main killer of your antigen. And you need to kill that proteases. So either you use PMSF, that is protease inhibitor. There are six or seven different protease inhibitors. I, I have not put all over here, but PMSF is almost universal protease inhibitor that will protect your antigen. PMSF, it, you can purchase from Sigma Altrich. PMSF. Then other are sucrose, sorbitol. They are acts as a solubilant or they solubilize your antigen efficiently. You can add also glycerol up to 5 to 10% of glycerol. And benzoate, it also acts as a protease inhibitor. So the, believe me, there are at least 20 or 25 different compounds which could be used in the sample preparation, but I kept as short as possible. Okay, this is in case of uh, eukaryotic cells and i kept this slide uh, because uh, those who are working with intracellular pathogens for them this is good slide i don't want to uh, go into details but this is a protocol for the uh, sample preparation so i can share this slide with you those i i don't want to spend a lot of time in that because this is some protocol only okay uh, one very important thing what you see here in this protocol is you have some buffer you have some or tris buffer and so on uh, you have here dnas do you see here dnas why do you need dnas for the sample preparation we are talking about antigen we are talking about proteins why dnas is necessary Any clue? 
So the problem, main problem is, okay, uh, let us clear some fundamentals here. What do you think? The, if I have 100 nucleotide DNA, 100 base pair DNA, and 100 amino acid protein, which will be the bigger, DNA or protein? Huh? Exactly opposite. Okay, <laughs> so the DNA is, that is, that's why we call DNA a macromolecule, not micromolecule. So DNA is a macromolecule. And DNA is so flexible. It is like, you, you, you can fold DNA by any means. Protein, no. Okay, so we think that protein is bigger molecule. <clears throat> DNA is bigger molecule. Now, let's come back, back to our assay. We have gigabyte, gigabytes or several uh, millions of uh, uh, nucleotides in the cell. All these are going to come out when we are lysing the cell, right from the bacteria, right from the eukaryotic or parasite, right? And those will stick there. And they will make a problem. They will, they will cover your antigen, and the antibody is not going to reach your antigen. So what you need to do? You need to remove this cover. That is DNA, RNA. For example, if you are uh, isolating from the cell, eukaryotic, you have tremendous amount of RNA over there. You have DNA. You have microRNAs and all this genomic uh, mess is there. You need to get rid of that. That's why you need DNAs. Okay. So use DNAs. This will fall into nucleotides and your protein will be free of this cover. Yeah, so how, how to remove the cover is either you use the method of autolytic cleavage of DNA or autolytic cleavage of RNA, or you use DNAs1, DNAs1 or DNAs2 enzyme. So we'll not go deep into that, their mode of action, but DNAs1 or DNAs2, both you can purchase from Sigma. RNA is one you can purchase from Sigma. So you just mix DNAs and RNAs, put into your sample, and it is fine. Okay. And then, once you have break your sample, once you have treated the sample with DNAs, once you have put their uh, urea or SDS page, at one point, you need to remove all these things, right? To make your protein a good, purified, and with high concentration. So there are n number of different purification techniques. Column chromatography, like uh, gel filtration, or affinity chromatography, or a molecular weight cut off technique or old school okay then you have two different old schools uh, Gutnesser was doing amazing old school technique he was coming with hydrated sample okay it was old laboratory over there where Patur Kassar was sitting and there was only two uh, air conditions in the laboratory one air condition was in the clean room clean room it was and second one was where patur Kassar was sitting and yeah third was uh, speaker was sitting so he was continuing saying oh i don't have any air condition i need your device he was putting this dialysis bag uh, in front of blower okay in front of blower and around evening, five or six o'clock, and in the morning he was coming, it was dry, very nice, dry, and concentrated very nicely. So how, I don't know how many of you use this technique, but I still use this technique, <laughs> okay? And all 
I, I thought uh, people over there that this could be used. And, but then we found that uh, the blower is quite harsh. It dries the sample very fast. So if you have a defrost refrigerator, like it defrosts automatically or something, and if you put, it does the same job. Okay, so you just put this bag hanging somewhere and in the morning it is concentrated amazingly. Okay, so this is one technique. But before that, this, con this is just concentration, not dialysis. So let's go to dialysis. So dialysis is a, a state where the solutes try to find the equilibrium. Okay, so for example, you have inside now SDS, you have inside um, urea and some buffer. You need to get out of that. And here you have only phosphate buffer saline. So because of the equilibration, there is movement between this. Now, this dialysis is also dependent on molecular weight cut off. What is that? Can I use any dialysis bag? Yeah, so that is molecular weight cut off, okay? So, uh, for example, my antigen is the main antigen, uh, like uh, OSPA of Borrelia is around uh, 32 kilo Dalton. What pore size I should take? 32 kilo Dalton, at least three times less, 10 kilo Dalton, 10 kilo Dalton I should take, okay? so. Accordingly, accordingly, we can choose the dialysis bag pore size. The, have you seen the molecular weight cut of centrifugation devices? Anybody has used? No. You, ah, you have used. So I will explain them, okay? Because it's a similar uh, technique. So dialysis, most of you uh, know what is dialysis and you have done. Uh, as you know, dialysis is a little bit lengthy, and if ah here, so for dialysis, you need at least 10 times or 20 times volume, outside volume is 10 or 20 times or even more. Uh, if you don't have that much buffer, what to do? There is another alternative. The device looks like Oh, sorry. Okay, and here you have a membrane either like this or some devices they have a membrane here okay so this is a membrane over here and this membrane is porous this membrane is porous and this is a collection tube now if you put your sample over here and this membrane you choose 10k that is 10000 dalton okay if the protein is uh, 30 kilo Dalton, you choose 10K. And you can purchase this kind of devices from Sigma, from uh, from Merck. So they have molecular WMCO devices. So, and then you centrifuge. So what will happen, all the proteins which are bigger will remain here, and all the SDS page, um, all other solutes, uh, detergents, they will come over here. Okay, and even small proteins, small peptides, everything come down, and here it will be concentrated. So, similar like the dialysis, okay? Advantage, disadvantage. Expensive? Dialysis is not that expensive. Very fast, Sorry. half an hour. Very fast. Very fast. Dialysis overnight or one day now at a molecular level dialysis is a slow 
So, slow dynamics is fast dynamics. Now, protein, several proteins, they don't like to change their state very fast. They need some time. So, what happened is here, if you change the buffer, that means you centrifuge and you put some buffer over here and resuspend and take, the proteins will aggregate, may aggregate, not always, may aggregate. In dialysis, some protein will not aggregate, some protein will aggregate. Okay. Now there are two different dialysis. Dialysis at room temperature, dialysis at, at cold temperature. Proteins, those are not stable at room temperature, you can go for cold and vice versa. Again, advantage, disadvantage. At cold temperature, protein tends to aggregate. Room temperature, protein are happy. Okay, so you need to uh, check always uh, trial and error which device is good, but at the starting point, the dialysis is good, and dialysis is good at 17 to 18 degrees Celsius, not at room temperature, not at, not at 4 degrees Celsius, 17 and 18 is the best. Okay, keep it there overnight, and protein will be fine. Okay, then this is a small device conductometer. I, I don't know how many of you have, but if you have a pH meter, several pH meter comes with conductometer as well. And this is very good device for actually to test uh, whether the dialysis was okay or not. Amazing, nobody ha of you have used that, I'm sure. <laughs> so the trick is very simple. You measure the, with this pH meter or conductometer, so there is another mode in several pH meter there is either conducti conductivity or pH. So with the mode of conductivity, you just put the probe over here before dialysis and measure the conductivity. After dialysis, measure the conductivity. Simple idea. So you will see that the conductivity has changed substantially. That means dialysis work. Why you need that? You put your sample in the dialysis bag, that doesn't mean it will dialyze. No way. It de because dialysis depends on the concentration of solute. I'm talking about solute, not talking about the protein. Now, if you have not digested your sample with DNAs, with RNAs, sometimes some, uh, you need to remove the glycans as well, and so on. So what will happen, all they will stick to the inner side of the dialysis bag. And they will occupy these pores and the dialysis rate of dialysis will be hindered. So don't take into consideration or uh, don't think that once you put your sample, tomorrow morning I will come and I will be happy. No way. You need to test that. And that are two different tests. If you have used some detergent, some detergent, okay? So there is simple test. And if you have used no detergent, but uh, this kind of device will help you to check whether there was dialysis or not. Now, if you have used detergent, SDS, and you need to take out that detergent before assay development, very simple test. In childhood, we were doing. So you take soap water, in the petri dish and put sample so if there is still detergent what will happen so will simple test so these two tests you you have to do conductivity and soap test and with that you are now sure that okay dialysis was fine but you need to check this part of the bag you need to check whether there is some precipitate if that precipitate is there, don't take that precipitate. You need to centrifuge the sample and take the supernatant. Okay. And 
and the last so you need to check how much of uh, antigen i'm going to add whether in micro or nanograms and so on but before that don't forget to centrifuge for protein centrifugation is can you tell me what is centrifugation force g force a standard centrifugation for protein proteomics for example so 15000 g for 20 minutes at least to separate the soluble proteins from insoluble proteins okay 15000 g not rpm g and then you measure the concentration of protein okay so these are the four standard methods lowry bradford uh, 280 uh, and turometric how many of you have done bradford yeah bradford bradford lowry or lowry okay so both are fine the principle is a bit different lowry is more wider than bradford uh, but for PhD students or master students, I think spectrophotometer is fine as well. <laughs> uh, but why spectrophotometer is not good? Let, let's talk about some advantage, disadvantages. So young people sitting over there, they will know not always quick methods are good methods. Okay. So what is problem with the spectrophotometer? Actually, each method has its pro and cons. The spectrophotometer relies on the tryptophan residue. So this tryptophan residue will absorb the light, okay? Light at 280. So absorption, the rate of absorption or amount of absorption depends on tryptophan. There is another one more amino acid and that you will tell me tomorrow so this is home assignment for you so one is tryptophan okay so there are two amino acids which you need to have in the protein or antigen and those protein must be on the surface okay not inside the molecule so if this is a protein it is globular for example there are several amino acid inside Inter, intramolecular amino acid and surface uh, amino acids right and you need to have these two amino acids on the surface then only they will absorb the light okay otherwise your protein is not going to absorb the light and you never know how many of this tryptophan and other guy are on the surface and you never know how how many of them in each protein so uh, this spectrophotometrically you are not going to quantify exactly and the bradford and lowry they have their advantages and disadvantages so this is also homework for you uh, why bradford why lowry okay we are not going to go into this fluorometry uh, because it's not commonly used. And then you need to test, once you have the um, measurement done of your protein, you need to test uh, how your protein look like, like or either by SDS page or electrofocusing or uh, this is some primary structure analysis or something that you don't need but either sds page or electrofocusing is done and your sample is ready okay so sample preparation sometimes takes month immunoassay takes one day 
okay that's why i devoted that much time for the sample preparation the start is good finish is good okay any question in this sample preparation please ask um i try to focus more on this stage or on this step because uh These are standard. You can purchase antibodies. Either they come from serum, either they you can purchase conjugate. They come. What is variable in all the assay antigen? Okay, you have it good. Your result is good. Every other thing are commercially available. Okay, so if you want to make the assay, if you then you have to have very good sample preparation yes yes concentration my phd work also we are using the per evaporation method same that uh, that method was done but again we are done one polyethylene glycol in dialysis tube we are taken the crude antigen and in petri dish we are using the start polyethylene glycol salt over that and keep in four degrees centigrade so within uh, three to four hours all this uh, two liter antigen will be reduced uh, up to 200 ml yes so uh, very concentrated that method i have also used in my phd work yes for evaporation method i'm using this polyethylene glycol salt okay polyethylene glycol salts are used we also use commonly the polyethylene glycol salts uh, i forgot to mention here so have you do you have any idea of
all the online uh, participants we are taking a 5 minutes break now and we'll uh, resume again thank you We made uh, expression cassette. Uh, so this expression cassette in our laboratory we produced. That is for the homologous recombination. This is this part and this part. Here we insert our gene. So we amplify the gene, which encodes the antigen of your interest. For example, then here is sick histidine tag, stop codon, and the uh, resistance marker. So this is simple expression cassette and we produce uh, and but what we wanted to see is not only the gene which or antigen which we are going to express but this antigen should be fluorescent so we will know that how much protein is produced in the expression system so uh, what we did is this is gene and to this uh, three end or the c terminus we put green fluorescent protein gene now this gene is attached with your green fluorescent protein and in uh, and in the in the uh, leishmania you see very nice production of the recombinant protein uh, when you see under the microscope uh, fluorescent microscope and
हेलो So, what we did is uh, instead of spending two to three months, we use simple uh, PCR technique and primer design technique to make all this. We call it expression cassette. So, we prepared the expression cassette and fuse the expression cassette. Or change both uh, batteries. Okay. okay. So, okay. so, so. Can I start? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, fragment one, it is produced based on PCR and we have it in kilos, for example. This is also we have. And what you need is just to have your PCR product or gene encoding antigen. And this is a primer, or this fragment, this part of the insert will attach to this part, and this part will attach to this part. Okay, so it is a complementary. And because of the polymerase, what will happen is it will start filling. From the C end, this will start filling from the C end, this, this will start filling from the C end, and so on. And in the second step of PCR, everything will be filled, and this fragment will be attached together to make one double stranded DNA. Okay, so this is very in short. What happens? So, um, when you put your expression cancer into Lishmania, the Lishmania will start to produce your antigen and green fluorescent antigen. That fluorescent antigen, what we devised our Lishmania's uh, 
that they secrete their antigen into the medium. So you don't need to break any cell. Only uh, antigen will be out in the medium. In medium, there is no protein. Medium is, is a BHI medium, brain heart infusion. So brain heart infusion has no protein. It has only peptide. So if your protein is 30 to 40 kilodalton or 10 kilodalton, for example, it will be very pure band uh, in SDS page, very pure antigen. Uh, and yes. Okay. So uh, these proteins, what you see, it starts to secrete into the medium. And you take your medium like what you took hydrated. Um, fluid and in the same way uh, you can concentrate and you can use it for the uh, assay okay so this is one of the techniques to produce recombinant proteins so in what we showed here with this technique we have till today we have produced uh, hundreds of different proteins and hundreds of different antigens but uh, well, this is, these are some extremely difficult to produce proteins, butylonecrin, pd 4 p factor H, and these are very huge proteins. And it is, uh, the limitation of recombinant protein technology is if the protein is huge or big, that is more than 100 kilodalton, it is very difficult to produce. So, but with Lishmania, we were able to produce, for example, factor H, which is very big protein, or a CD or CPOVP, which is around 400 kilodalton proteins, huge proteins. But we were successful protein. And then we also published. Uh, this is very, very good protein that is serum amyloid A, that is for the, uh, is a marker for the acute phase protein. So, for example, in mastitis, you can use this protein, uh, serum amyloid. Actually, as the UK guy, Mark, he wanted to establish the immunoassay in fish, in salmon, uh, acute phase protein uh, or infection in the salmon. We are talking here about the veterinary field, but we can also produce antigen for the fishery. Now, we have have different uh, approaches like bacteria we have, we have uh, cells, we have Leishmania or Pitya pastoris and so on. But we want to produce protein very fast. I don't want to wait for one or two months or one or two weeks. I want today. Okay. And this can be done actually. So how? Uh, I want to just test whether my antigen or my mutated antigen or my different uh, or antigen from different species could work, could be used in assay or not. And for that, I don't need my antigen uh, in microgram or milligram. For that, I need one spot in one nanogram or one picogram level. And for that, I can produce proteins in vitro, in tube. So again, uh, we went back to the Purana side, who discovered the protein synthesis technology way back in 1961. Uh, and they were trying to produce protein, that means synthesis of protein from DNA in tube to protein. Okay, and uh, till today there are different expression system so in vitro so you can purchase from i think in vitro then uh, e coli and uh, rabbit reticulocyte or bit jump as well so you can purchase free, free system commercially but we wanted to take advantage of leishmania because we were working a lot on leishmania system to produce recombinant proteins and why we should not use this recombinant technology for in vitro as well so uh, in Germany, we started with the Siena with uh, bioscience. We started to prepare the cell life set and uh, make the expression system. 
So the advantage is is very quick. We don't need to wait for months and weeks. Uh, several toxic proteins we can <clears throat> produce and no proteolytic degradation. So proteolytic degradation is extremely important criteria in the protein synthesis because whatever proteins we produce more often they get degraded because they are foreign. So system. Uh, the fundamental of this system is that in PCR tube, of the in PCR tube uh, or in ELISA place, what you have to do, you have to stick your RNA or DNA, okay, DNA or RNA on the surface. But like your antigen, you stick it. So this sticking is just by passive absorption with uh, or drying, and then you put the um, translation machinery that you produce, uh, we produce translation machinery, and this machinery you put and you incubate two hours, the machinery will trans uh, start to transcribe the DNA into RNA and RNA into protein, and it takes two hours. Okay. So, <laughs> what we did is with OEPCR, we produce this DNA or mRNA. So we produce uh, this DNA, and we were successful in producing uh, just just only 1.8 microliter of the reaction. In 1.8 microliter of reaction, we were able to produce the recombinant protein. Uh, that recombinant protein was we. It was necessary to identify whether this recombinant protein is produced or not, and then we took advantage of advantage of green fluorescent protein. So we attach our uh, protein with the green fluorescent protein, and under the microscope we saw that if we attach the DNA with gene producing gene green fluorescent protein, the green fluorescent protein is attaching to the target. And this is your antigen. Okay, and under the microscope, you see very nice fluorescent protein. Okay, so still here, everything was fine. Uh, we were able to produce protein in tube, but we wanted to make some array because for assay or uh, for the Western blot or immunoblot, you need some array like structure, right? So, what we did is we attach our DNA on the PBDS membrane, and we put just two microliter of the lysate or drop, and that everything we incubated in the humid chamber. And after two hours, what we saw is this one. So, different proteins were produced in each spot, and periodically, if you use different PCR products, if you use different mutants, if you use different antigens, if you use, if you want to screen various antigens, you can have in each spot different antigens. And this you can use for the screening of immunoassay, for the screening of antibody. So it was really advanced technique how to produce in one or two days uh, different antigens and set up your Assay. So this was also published rapid in vitro protein synthesis pipeline. And, and that's it. So this is just a small sneak peek of how we produce or how we establish the uh, recommended protein technology. And apart from that, we also use uh, Equaline, uh, which is cheaper and faster as well. In vitro is faster but not cheaper. In vitro is expensive. Okay. And uh, we have also produced uh, the system which will produce protein in eukaryotic or prokaryotic also. I will not take that point ahead because that will be a much for you. So <clears throat> what I, I want to Summarize is we can 
produce different proteins in E. coli, in Leishmania, or in in vitro system as well. The protein looks same, and you can use that protein for the assay development. Okay, so thank you very much for this part. And now we will go to basic principles of assay. Okay. Any question in this part? I make it very rapid. This part. I know how, how 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 I can close this. No panel, I That, that is fine. Okay, now you are going to tell me which components one by one uh, for the direct ELISA. We are not going to have the indirect or what, but normal components in any immunoassay. So I will start with antigen. So antigen, we saw till morning how we should produce and how the recombinant protein we should produce. So we will skip. Then what comes? A, B, or this? Then. And then right? And then okay, and then a substrate. And then in here. Okay. So four basic Now, apart from the IC component, what do we have? Retrofix. ELISA, nitrocellulose, PVDF, and so on. Or some array chip matrices. Okay. And then what we have is blocking. We need to block. Then we have Washing. Then we have blocking agent, right? We need some blocking agent into antibody and secondary antibody as well. And then we have substrate and detectors. So we have either uh, color. Luminators, infrared, and so on. So we have uh, one, two, three, four main players. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and nine, ten, ten different players as well. So combinatorially, combinatorially, uh, the combinations are extremely vast. Huge. So to get the specific concentration, specific amount of each and every component is extremely difficult because it is a combination. So that's why we say that when God was very happy, he created human. And when devil 
was extremely angry, he created immunoassay. <laughs> yeah. It looks very simple, but it is one of the most difficult parts in the research. You can PCR no problem, you can play with a microRNA, NGS, everything is fine, but if you come to the immunoassay, you are done. Okay. So those who think that it is simple and you are doing a good job or basic, we are not producing good results. No, this is not good because immunoassay development is one of the most challenging jobs because you have different combinations and to get the optimum is difficult and you need very deep knowledge of each and every component. Okay. What if I change? What if I change the convention? What if I use different blocking agents and so on? So this part could be extended all day. This part could be cut short one hour. It's up to you. Just tell me and we will process. Because actually just antigen we covered almost two to three hours. And each part we can cover two to three hours. Okay, and including these components. So it's up to you how deep you want. We will go with simple version and uh, we will check advantages and disadvantages because that will be helpful for you. Okay. Okay, so uh, let's talk about so write this down, please, and we will come back one by one. So this is uh, well versed membrane battle. So use the so first I should say that wells are easy to handle. There is minimum cross contamination from well to well, and you can make a lot of replicates. In case of membrane, uh, membrane are expensive than the wells. ELISA plates are cheaper, but there is Big disadvantage. How much protein you can put in one well, Eliza well? Any idea? Hundred nanograms. Not more than that. Because the surface is limited. It depends on protein, but in case of mole, hundred to two hundred mole or nanograms you can add. You cannot you can you can put five milligrams in that, but it will not attach, it will work. Here you can put as much as you can. No problem. You can put one microliter on the membrane, wait for a while, get dry on the same drop. Again one microliter on the same drop. Again, well, you can increase the cost concentration as much as you can. This So nitrocellulose membrane is very fragile. This is quite sturdy. And in case of reusability, uh, this you can use reuse frequently. This you cannot reuse. Okay. So reusing means once you do the assay, ELISA, uh, or Western blot, you can reuse. You cannot reuse. So, it's about uh, different mattresses, but in case of ELISA, you can purchase different sub or substances or the mattresses. For example, you have you have classical ELISA well, classical. then you have Maxisol. So this is Maxi or Mirisol. So Maxi and Midi, they will give you more attachment of your protein. This is classical and this will go up to 400 nanograms. And this is. So it depends on your, um, how intense signal you want, how sensitivity you need. Okay. 
then these are the simple NHS plate or you have nickel plate. Write down NHS and then um, thermo scientific they sell NHS plate. NHS plate means here is a pure adsorption. Okay, there is no concrete binding. So what may happen you if you touch washings, the antigen will slip up. Okay, so that's the problem, and whole sensitivity will be down. NHS plate, what will happen is it is covalently bound because of NHS chemistry. So you have antigen, you mix the reagent, and then you put it here. So covalently it will bind, and covalent bind bond is one of the most strongest bond. That's why you will have strongly attached your antigen to the well, and then you can reuse a lot because it is fixed over there. And the nickel. So you have here nickel ions on this plate. And this nickel ion will attach or capture all the histidines from the multi histidine tag. So, this can be also used to capture specific histidine proteins. Now, there are different other plates. The protein are either They have N terminal and T terminal, right? Each protein has N terminal, C terminal. Your antigen or epitope could be here or could be here. Okay, what will happen? If I use this protein in here, this protein can attach to the and the tubes are not available for antibodies. Okay, so it is, it is hindered. It is the hindrance of the companies they are producing is with A terminal attachment and with C terminal attachment. So all these thermal scientific they are selling. So you can attach your protein with C terminus or you can attach your protein with N terminus. So you can protein attach like this or attach like this. Okay. So if you want, I can send information about that. I and we don't need to waste time. You can read all these techniques: Maxi, MIDI, NHS, LI, N terminus, and C terminus. So these are different ELISA techniques, how to bind your antigen to the plate. Uh, specificity, no. Uh, specificity, no. No. Uh, but the sensitivity will be very high because all the antigens are directed to one end. So for example, uh, you want to have very high sensitivity or your epitope should be up, not down, right? And automatically you will increase the sensitivity. And then see, won't matter. Sorry? No, not fine. It's not fine. I mean, sometimes this, you, will, you will not have a good signal with this classical approach. But with this approach, you will have better results. No, you need to know how your epitope. That you lost there, actually. Okay. So, uh, if you see the protein, the database gives you an idea where is your epitope. And you can also study very well 
with the bioinformatic tool, which I'm going to tell you on Thursday. Uh, on what side you have epitome or your epitope, I mean, which you are interested in. And if that epitope is, if that epitope is C terminus, you use N terminus binding. Okay, so if the epitope is here, you bind like this. And if your epitope is here, you bind like this. Okay, and that will substantially reduce your non-specificity as well, because there is no non-specificity of the functional epitope or cleric binding. Okay, so this is about different clerics, what you can use. Any uh, question over here in the, in the, in the place? Or it was as boring as first part. <laughs> okay, uh, to the membrane. Membrane, uh, I recommend you to use PVDF rather than microcellulose membrane. And we will talk more in the blocking about the PVDF. Okay? The advantage of PVDF over NC. So let's delete. The part. And the second player is uh, blocking, right? You attach your antigen wherever you want and you have to block. So, for those who don't know what is blocking, so if this is a plate, if this is a uh, membrane, if this is PDF or if this is all, whatever you want. You put your antigen, okay, an antigen will uh, attach like this, either with passive adsorption or you know, NHS chemistry or whatever. But these sites are free. These sites are still free. And where your primary antibody or this is also out of order. I think internet is the issue today. Huh? Hello. That blocking is uh, again a uh, very big rocket science. Okay, that binding is really rocket science because there are hundreds of different blocking agents. There are three or four categories of blocking proteinous blocking, non proteinous blocking, and so on. So we will go one by one. Uh, you have PSA, bovine serum albumin. You have, let me, milk or skim milk. Okay. You have crazy word. Is somebody playing with that or it is automatic? Okay. Sorry. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine? Okay. A BSA, milk, then gelatin. What else? What do you use? 
BSA. Sorry? Theorem. Theorem. That can be it. Again, uh, some more? No, that's it. So, which is the cheapest? It's cheap milk. You can purchase from the market as well, right? So, milk and gelatin are fine. Uh, unfortunately, here you have biotin. You cannot use for streptavidin and biotin interaction. Gelatin, soluble or not soluble? Do you think it's soluble? It's very difficult to solubilize. If you purchase very pure, it will solubilize. It, if you will purchase whatever gelatin, then it will not get solubilized. And the concentration is limited in that case. You cannot go up to 3% of gelatin or 2% of gelatin, 1%. You, have, you are limited with some concentration. BSC is amazing, is amazingly expensive as well. <laughs> so plus and minus, then serum. Yeah. <laughs> so the serum, uh, yeah, serum is good option and serum is traditionally used for immuno uh, fluorescent assays, but not classical uh, because it is also extremely expensive serum. So what we use is, is uh, bovine serum albumin, BSA. Ah, okay. So uh, we use uh, bovine serum albumin, a fraction five. So there are different albumins. So you have to use fraction five. Don't, don't try to use different BSAs. With fraction five, you will have a really good result. Sorry, whatever, we, we use uh, Sigma, BSA, but uh, whatever. Now, gelatin comes from which species? Gelatin come, can come from any, any species, but which gelatin you buy? Fish gelatin. Buy fish. Look, we all veterinarians, we work with cow, buffalo, dog, cat, and so on. So there are chances of some cross reactivity. So we have to take some other protein from unrelated species, right? So that's why fish gelatin is the best and it is cheap as well. So either use salmon gelatin or carp gelatin or so on. So you can purchase fish gelatin as well. So these are some experience what I uh, uh, I am using. My first choice is BSA, second choice is gelatin for me, and third choice is milk. Why not milk? Biotin is there, and it may happen that there could be some antibody from the I mean, you know, so these are the classic. These are the classic. Uh, so this you need to solubilize into PDA or TDA buffer and then use. Okay. Then there is uh, one more guy which is very good. Say. Twin 20. Now, this Twin 20 is amazing, and you can use um, most of the techniques. They say that you can use it with BSA. That means you use PBST buffer or PBST buffer, and then put BSA. That is wrong. Okay, why? I will explain. Now, Twin 20 wants to sit where the space is empty. Now this thing, twin 20 wants to come over here. BSA also wants to come over there. Okay, then why to fight these two? So either keep twin, twin 20 or keep BSA for the blocking. Don't never add twin 20.
LD as well as BSA together, then you have heterogeneous blocking. Twin 20 blocking as well as BSA blocking. Okay. Now this is all theory is fine. Let's go to some biological or molecular biology stuff. What is molecular weight of BSA? Molecular weight of BSA. Go answer him, albumin. How you will develop assay if you don't know <laughs> these details? Okay, so molecular weight is 60 to 66 kilodalton depending on the animal species or I'm talking about serum albumin, not BSA, but serum albumin. BSA is 60 kilodalton. And you want to develop SA, right? Now, if you take Mimoto, if you take oxygen, is of 10 kilodalton. Okay? So if the will zoom in, what will happen? Look, this is this is 10 kilodalton and this is 60 kilodalton. Do you think that your antibody will reach to your? No. So that's the major thing you have to consider. What is the molecular weight of your antigen in the mess of your different antigens? What you have prepared? If it is wholesale antigen. If it is all cell antigen, you have one antigen here, uh, you have your antigen here, then BSA will come, it will a mess. So you have to think how big is your protein, how big is your antigen. And according to that, you have to put the blocking agent. Otherwise, you will theoretically hinder your assay. Okay? So, bovine serum albumin. BS10 is 16. What about skin milk? What is there actually? What is there that will block? Milk protein. What is there? Casein. This is casein. Casein. Or casein. Casein. And molecular weight of casein, that is your homework. <laughs> so, molecular weight of casein you need, and then gelatin. Molecular weight of gelatin is very big molecule. That is also your homework, so you will understand which I, I should use. Okay, so gelatin. And molecular weight of twin, twin 20. Okay, so what is molecular weight of? Between 20, you need to know. And when you are using <coughs> or any, any detergent, you need to know its micelle formation, forming weight. That is another theory or another topic that will not go deep into that. Only what you need to do is you need to put between 20 and vortex very well. Okay, do not use just unvortex. Okay? Otherwise, it will make clumps or micelle, and they are very big. So we saw BSA against milk or casein against gelatin. Questions? So let's go to between 20. So there are two different things. You will have between 20. You have between 80 as well. Okay, between 20 is better, between 80 would be if you are using very sticky protein. I recommend between 80 if you are not using sticky protein, between 20 is okay. Then there is all these we saw are proteinous blocking agent, they are protein. Okay. Gelatin or albumin. In 20 is non proteinous. So there are two categories. 
non-proteinous blocking. So in non-proteinous blocking patient, you can also have N40, uh, non-proteinous. My PhD student, they, uh, they prefer non-proteinous blocking agent. And now let's back to NC and uh, PVD. Okay? And you will see how it was amazing. If you know the basic principles of the membranes and So we have two membranes. One is NC, one is PVDS, natural cellulose and PVDS membrane. The NC is hydrophilic or hydrophobic? Hydrophilic or hydrophobic? Hydrophobic NC is hydrophobic. PVDF is hydrophobic. Is extremely important hydrophilic or hydrophobic. Okay, now what I did, I put my proteins over here. They will attach very well because the memory is hydrophilic, it is like paper. So, whatever I, I, I put there, it will get attached. No problem, it will go. So, what you have to do is you have to make this membrane hydrophilic. And most efficient way to make anything hydrophilic is put into the ethanol, alcohol, methanol, ethanol, whatever. So, you put your membrane in first ethanol, wash it with any aqueous solution or CBS, it remains the hydrophilic. Now you put your proteins. Okay. So both both membranes are now hydrophilic. This is hydrophilic by birth, and this is hydrophilic after birth. Okay. We we made it hydrophilic, and we put the proteins. Everything is same now. Now. Several people, most of the people, what they do is they go directly for the blocking, they go directly for the primary antibody and secondary antibody. Everything is fine, but great. Now, I don't want any blocking. What I will do is I will try this membrane with hair fan. Because they use yeah. hair dryer. Hair dryer, and I will dry this membrane in one or two minutes. So the structure will be structure will be like this. I have proteins attached due to hydrophilicity over there. Now it is turned to hydrophobic because it is dry. So when it is in ethanol, it turns to hydrophilic. Then it maintains its hydrophilicity in the water. And when it gets dry, again it is. And now, as this is hydrophobic, uh, I, I ask you the question if I put something in a hydrophobic, will it attach? No, right? So if I put my primary antibody, will it attach? No, it will not attach. But there is one hydrophilic part. This the protein is hydrophilic. Yeah, these proteins are hydrophilic, and the membrane remains hydrophobic because this is dry. And this dry, dry membrane you incubate in your primary antibody. Primary antibody won't attach over here. You don't need any. Uh, blocking agent. So this is third technique. You have blocking proteinous, you have blocking non-proteinous, you have no blocking agent. Okay.
What was second point? So we are done with talking. So which washing agent do you use? And what is the percentage of clean? Zero point zero five percent, five hundred micro liter in five hundred ml or one ml. Either. So I think it is zero point zero five percent. Now there are two tricks. One you can use for washing either blocking buffer if you are using the twin or only uh, PBSP without any block. Washing is five minutes with protectant. Now I will ask you for Eliza, what is RPM you are using for working, that is extremely important. What is RPM you are using for washing? Revolution to a manual. Okay, so you're not your um, well, automatic washer, we don't have any lab. Okay. Then in that case, we are writing that washer. A big slip of that place. On the that shaker like this. Like this by hand. And then that's on the Actually, what we have experienced is uh, if you purchase this shaker like this, uh, normal shaker, shaker that costs $500, so maybe in India it is cheaper. And if you use 500 revolution per minute, uh, rotation per minute, that will give you, or that will reduce your non specificity tremendously. So it is just one minute, one inch for washing. Okay, third step is um, antibody, primary antibody. So I will go back to the primary antibodies. What we saw uh, is normal primary antibody is polyclonal. Monoclonal antibody. So this is old school polyclonal against monoclonal antibody. There is always debate if I should, should I use monoclonal antibody or polyclonal antibody or acidic fluid as well. So in my experience, uh, Although I use uh, monoclonal antibody, sometimes I have no specificity there. But nowadays, what we are using, so what we are using is uh, NB, that is nanobody. What I showed you the first day, that we are producing nanobodies. So we are routinely using nanobodies and we are not using polyclonal antibody or monoclonal. Advantage is very cheap and very stable. Okay. And then what you can use is uh, some peptides, or also you can use uh, examine or DNA examine. Sorry. Online participants. Mr. Rashid Ali, can you switch off your mic? It's disturbing the class.
Okay, secondary antibody, let's go for second. And incubation is one hour, right? With poly, uh, monoclonal antibody or primary antibody, one hour incubation with uh, secondary antibody is one hour. Now, secondary antibody, all the guys. Either you make the conjugate or you purchase the conjugate. Okay. I prefer to make my own conjugates because we are producing antibodies. HRP against AP, a client phosphatase. Okay, there is always defect AP or HRP. I like HRP because I. What I Okay, so we have a lot of horseradish in the garden. So the horseradish peroxidase is from that plant. Uh, now, the disadvantage, okay? If I use horseradish peroxidase, I never be able to buy my if I'm going for the Western law. Eliza, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. I, I think I should stop now. Okay. I, I will end up with this session, I think. So, uh, um, what I want to tell you that uh, you have. So there is one more uh, conjugate, it is called as infrared conjugate, IR. So uh, you, you can purchase IR dye from the Lycor company or from Thermo Scientific. Okay. I forgot. Plant sleeper. Using that plant. Uh, actually, HRP is derived from the plant, outside its plant. Okay. And uh, HRP is quite universal. The alkaline phosphorylated system is not universal, so better to use HRP technique rather than or secondary antibody conjugated with HRP rather than alkaline phosphatase. Okay, because alkaline phosphatase is limited to phosphate uh, buffer, so you sh you cannot combine. And as a thumb of rule, what you have to use is for ELISA, you have to use phosphate buffer saline (PBS). And for Western blood and other immunoassays, you can use PBS. Okay, so this is just my experience. And I recommend you to go for the luminescence uh, assay if you have uh, luminescence detector. But TMB chromogenic detector is fine. TMB. So what I use is ultra TMB. It is from again thermo scientific. It's called as ultra TMB. The, I wanted to go deep into this TMB, but already is one o'clock. TMB and substrate. There are advantages, disadvantages. Which substrate you should use? There are uh, different substrates: chromogenic substrate, luminescent sub substrate, uh, chemiluminescent substrate, then luciferous assays or substrate. And then infrared substrate. So 
is a huge information over there. But again, let's cut it short. TMB and HRP is the best choice for ELISA. For Western blot, uh, the best choice is HRP combined with West Dura Cheminum substrate. West Dura Cheminum substrate. Both are from thermal scientific. And another technique, you have uh, antibody. Uh, you don't have your, any enzyme, but it, it, it has infrared uh, fluorophore. Okay. So either it is 700 nanometer, nanometer excitation or 800 nanometer excitation. There are two different fluorophores available. You need for, for this, you need scanner, infrared scanner. It is not that expensive. And what will happen is you have your anti uh, antigen, primary antibody, and secondary, secondary antibody, which will report. And this directly you can scan. This fluorophore is extremely stable for up to one year. So if you have Western blot, you can blot anytime or you can send it by post to USA uh, or just you need to put into two different papers in envelope and it is stable. Now HRP is I'm talking about luminescence. Heavy luminescence is not a linear. The feminum luminescence will be you will see the light very fast and then the light will degrade. And this happens in seconds. It happens not in really, seconds, and always. Okay. Fluorophore or infrared is stable always. Okay, already one o'clock, you must be very hungry. So should we stop here? Any questions online or off? Any questions? Any questions? Online participants? Now the topic is open for discussion. You can ask any questions or you have any query. Four marches. <laughs> no questions? Okay, let's go for lunch. Yeah. So if no questions, thank you very much, sir, for very excellent information on immune assay development and whole process on antigen preparation. Thank you very much. Now for online participants, uh, uh, you have miss uh, one announcement that uh, in the afternoon we have a visit to NIRH. So there will be no lecture in the afternoon. Whatever Dr. Mangesh Bide, sir, has informed you so that uh, some of the study material also he will provide to us and uh, we'll give to you and whatever the uh, some of the assignments you have so that you can uh, continue with the assignments and you can read the related information so in the afternoon there will be no lecture we'll have a visit to nrh mumbai icr institute and uh, we will meet in the morning tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock Thank you.